You are listening to Mark Lack, and this is Retail 101 Online. Welcome all to episode number two, hosted by Mark Lack from Retail 101 Online. For those that don't know who we are yet, please listen to the first episode where I outline my experience within the retail sphere for a variety of different retailers around the world and what we're aiming to achieve with Retail 101 Online. For those that have already listened to some of my episodes, thanks for continuing to tune in and supporting our work in spreading retail education for all, no matter your level. If you are interested in hearing more about retail from retail people, also subscribe to the soon-to-be-released series, Retail Voices. These will be discussions with real people talking about their role in retail, how they got to where they are, and where they want to get to. Today, we are going to be talking about the subject of availability in supermarkets, as it's seen as a major KPI, or Key Performance Indicator. For those of you who want to learn more about the major KPIs in retail, please look out for a future episode on that subject. In a similar vein, within supermarkets, there are a huge amount of acronyms, and to demystify the world of supermarket acronyms, you will also need to look out for the episode on that topic too. However, when an acronym rears its ugly head in one of the episodes, I'll make sure to explain it straight away. For now, let's get into the main theme for today, which is supermarkets and on-shelf availability. So, what is availability? Well, in the context of supermarkets, availability simply means that a product is available for a customer to buy. However, it goes somewhat deeper than this, and as with everything in retail, it's not as simple as it first sounds. You may remember that I discovered the impact and importance of availability very early on in my career with Booker Cash and Carry. When I was working with the Metro Group in the UK under Macro Cash and Carry, the availability number was the first thing we used to see every morning as we walked into the office. That always let us know whether today was going to be a good day or not. To understand availability, you first have to distinguish what kind of availability number you are actually looking at. Is it system availability? Is it physical on-shelf availability? Or is it part of the assembly or disassembly products that are prepared in store? Understanding the number though is only the starting point. Where does that number come from? Who created it? How was it produced? And most importantly, when was it produced? How old is this information? We shall try and understand some of these through the discussion today. But in the main, we will be focusing on shelf availability specific to supermarket retailing. Let's just first look at the significance of availability for both the retailer and customers. Firstly, the retailer. That would be us. There seems to be a pretty obvious significance to the retailer of poor on-shelf availability. For starters, there is the loss of sales. Or is there? Very little research exists as to how customers act when they cannot find their preferred item on shelf. And yes, like everyone else, I googled it. As retailers, we tend to assume we lose the sale in total. However, the limited research papers that are available and how customers act when shopping online for groceries is starting to give us some insights as to how they function. As a rule of thumb, if a customer cannot find the item they are looking for, they may do one of four things. One, choose the same brand, but a different pack size, so they end up pack size switching. Two, choose the same product type, but a different brand so now they're brand switching. Three, choose an entirely different product type to fulfill the need, so now they're completely product switching. And number four, not buy anything at all for that particular need. Experience suggests that it is split approximately 30, 30, 30, 10% over those four choices. With only 10% choosing not to buy anything at all, this then suggests the potential loss from an item being out of stock and not on shelf is less critical than first thought. After all, we are still getting the 90%. However, 
This misses the point of the customer's shopping habits and needs, as it only looks at a single product during a single shopping mission and not that product as part of a whole shop and the supermarket brand's image. A customer who notices out of stock and not on shelf items over a number of shopping occasions will eventually choose to go somewhere else if on shelf availability is seen as an issue. A huge reminder here that one of the customer drivers for shopping at a particular store as part of PACAS, P-A-Q-A-S, is availability. Look out for that acronym in a future episode. Poor availability on shelf causes issues within the supply chain and with suppliers as well. Some of them may have contributed funds to display a particular item on a particular shelf as part of the BDAs, business development agreements, but more on that in a later episode. Ultimately, empty shelves do not look good and it may look like the retailer is going out of business or has a very untidy store, which turns off even more customers. And now, what about the significance of on-shelf availability to the customer? Well, changes in shopping behavior and to the family unit over time, such as more people are now living alone. People are living for longer. How the recent pandemic has changed shopping habits with more frequent visits, smaller baskets, and working from home. More proximity shopping. More convenience foods and or smaller pack sizes. These have all had an impact on supply chain and stock management in relation to on-shelf availability. Add into this the e-commerce platforms and picking in store, or even from an attached dark store warehouse, it has created a situation for the customer whereby too often they come into a store and the item they were looking for is just not there. As mentioned earlier, whilst they may make one of four choices, it does not take too many visits, usually about three times, before the customer starts to question that store's ability to service their needs and they start to look for alternatives. This negative impact is usually only picked up in a store's loyalty program, if the system, or even some kind of human intervention, is set up for that. But unfortunately, by then, it can be too late to recover the customer. There are numerous reasons and factors that influence on-shelf availability. However, as I have fallen foul of the dreaded low availability result, I had to investigate for myself what was going on. And these are some of the major ones I have come across in previous businesses that I have been in. First, poor inventory management, whereby things like corrections are not made onto the system due to losses. For example, theft, incorrect adjustments, for example, with wastage, incorrect scanning. For example, the checkout operators are not scanning variants correctly. Incorrect receiving, for example, singles are being received as outers. And incorrect system setup, for example, barcode errors. Number two, supply chain inefficiencies, such as there's no integration with suppliers. Situations where the supplier is a distributor and their supplies are imported, potentially causing a famine or feast problem. Central warehouses with inefficient logistics, for example, picking and load balancing, which leads to short or partial deliveries suppliers not having delivery cycles or specific order and delivery dates. MOQs, minimum order quantities, and or EOQs, economic order quantities, that do not match sales or the available space. Pack sizes do not match sales or shelf space, large outer or shipping pack sizes. Products come in those really boring standardized brown shipping boxes and are not in SRP, shelf ready packaging. The last 20 meters getting from the store warehouse to the store shop floor. It could be inefficient and there's no way for the warehouse team to inform the store floor team that an out of stock item has just arrived. Poor in-store layout and navigation so it's really difficult to get around. Lack of space planning leading to more or less SKUs, stock keeping units, than space for a given category. Number three, fresh products. They create their own whole new level of challenges. Whether that is the fruit and vegetables or the daily delivery products such as bread and milk. Within fruit and vegetables, there is the need to rotate, remove products for quality issues and general wastage from handling. Production cycles also play a part here for products that are inherently seasonal or only available for short periods of time. Or even only eaten during short periods of time in larger than normal quantities. 
the British obsession with satsumas over the Christmas season is one that particularly stands out. Number four, in-store production requires a level of planning that can be inefficient or the employees do not follow because it's inconvenient. For example, it's much easier to fill the oven with baguettes than to batch bake every four to six hours. Within the major in-store production departments, for example, bakery, butchery, delicatessen, fruit and vegetables, there is often a reluctance to prepare too much or too little, as that one other KPI, the big bad one called wastage, starts to rear its ugly head and departments will be challenged as to why these numbers are also so high. Number five, employee scheduling for shelf filling is inadequate and stock ends up either being stuck in goods receiving or too many aisles are crowded with a variety of cages and pallets and boxes and the employees themselves doing the shelf filling. Number six, demand forecasting is not sophisticated enough to track the trends. For example, seasonal variations like Christmas and Ramadan. Weather variations, for example, is it cold or hot? Is it raining today? And a complicated mix of DSD, direct store delivery, and own warehouses deliveries. Number seven, Systems that are not being updated frequently enough will also cause issues with any manual or automated ordering system. Not having a cutoff time for sales, stock, and other data inputs so that the system's algorithms can do their work will cause problems within the calculation. This can cause a double negative impact whereby a store could have too much of an item and not enough of another. Number eight, and finally, this is the one that causes the most problems manual interventions, the human influence. Whether it's a department supervisor or manager, store managers, buyers and category managers at head office, and of course the traveling salesman to the store. All of these people really think that they do know better than the system, ultimately ensuring chaos reigns when it comes to managing on-shelf availability. The customer experience, satisfaction, and loyalty will all be damaged when shelf availability is not at an optimum. How many times have you been let down when you're visiting your own store to buy groceries? I know I have when I have shopped in my own stores. Most customers have chosen to come to the store with a general idea or very specific idea as to what they want to purchase. Many customers in a supermarket come with an actual list of items they want to buy and supermarket retail is luckier than most other retail types. Customers do not come into a supermarket to browse. They already come to shop for something. So no conversion ratios are needed like in other retail stores. We usually get 100%. The focus needs to be on having the items that the customer already wants from us and then trying to add a little bit more as a one more in the basket effort. If an item or items are frequently off shelf, the customer will start to question their loyalty to a particular store, especially as market saturation and alternative choices, such as e-commerce and subscription-based shopping, becomes ever more prevalent. A customer will remain loyal, or at least continue shopping with you, as long as you are providing their needs. A store type, be it hyper, super, or convenience, helps in defining those needs in the mind of the customer. They wouldn't expect a full assortment in a convenience store, but they would expect their very basic needs to be taken care of. Some of this is about assortment, which I'll discuss in a later episode. But once that is properly defined, it then comes down to availability. If we already know all of these challenges within on-shelf availability, what are some of the strategies we can use to counter them and improve the customer's experience? There are several solutions. Some of them are about the human element, and some of them are technological. The main solution, and the first real solution, is about measurement, actually having proper measurement solutions in place. We do say in retail, what gets measured gets managed. A reminder that it is an important KPI. So important, in fact, that the first question I used to ask when visiting stores was, what's your availability today? Until we had resolved the issue, of course. Then we started focusing on some of the other KPIs, but availability was always at or near the top. This is the missing element from a lot of strategy development. Once you have achieved the target, you need to move the target again, 
or move it down the ranking of focus areas, otherwise you will end up flogging a dead horse. Availability can potentially be one of these. 100% availability is an admirable target. However, it is near impossible to achieve unless you have a very, very limited assortment. The mathematics required to achieve 100% availability have shown that for every 0.1% above a 98% optimum, you will end up adding 1% to the overall stock holding. To get above the optimum of 98% to 100% availability, that would mean adding an additional 20% to your stock holding. I am sure this would displease all of the financial managers we know. The balance you have to attain is where to achieve 100% and where not to. All of you, I'm sure, will have heard of the Pareto Principle. In retail supermarkets, this is where 20% of the products are responsible for 80% of the sales. It therefore makes sense to concentrate efforts on the 20% of the products, achieve as close to 100% there, which actually leads to a smaller increase in stock holding, if any, as the sales are usually greater in both volume and value and will be easier to manage the quantities to sale. The other 80% of the SKUs still need to be managed and monitored. However, the starting point should be those products that are most important to your customers as those are the ones that are currently being purchased. Initially, when I've done this previously, I have started with the top 100 selling products across the whole company. This will give you a flash view as to how well you are doing on the best products. Please note, best products doesn't necessarily mean profitable. It just means that this is where the cash is currently being generated. Once you have the first measurement, are you on your way to solving availability? Well, no, not yet. Now you need to look at some of the root causes. Some of the common reasons behind why a particular product is out of stock, as mentioned previously, and then start solving them. Remember, and this is something I try to stress very often, the measurement you have just completed is only the output. You need to actually start investigating the inputs. This is where the real action is at. Once you have seen the input, for example, poor scanning at the checkouts for variants is causing strawberry flavor yogurt to be out of stock, even when the system is showing positive stock because the operators are not scanning all the flavor variants individually. Now you can start looking at solutions. Let's just look at a few of the main solutions I have used in the past and some practical applications you can use in your own stores. Firstly, having an efficient restocking process and solution is one of the starting points for improving availability. Setting up the systems from initial supplier onboarding and product listing, including ongoing system updation, is vital. Some of these elements to get right include the agreement with the supplier for pack sizes, this helps with shelf space management. To ensure the correct barcodes for outers, packs and singles are correctly loaded and scannable by the goods receiving department, by customers via install price checkers or portable scanners for scan and go and self-scan checkouts, and of course, the main checkouts. The logistic type must also be agreed. Is it going to be direct store delivery or warehouse or even third party? The stock management technique. Is it store managed? Regional office, head office, warehouse, vendor managed, or even third party again. What are the min max requirements and the setting for both MOQ and or EOQ as a single product or part of the selection of products from the supplier? Another thing to get right, is it a single store, selection of regional stores, total company, maybe store type only, hyper, super, convenience. Something really important is the order type and cycle that must be confirmed. Will it be manually ordered, recommended ordered, or fully automated ordering? And which day or days of the week is the order to be placed and then the lead time for receiving? Once the system is set up, then you need to work out how the product makes its way from the goods receiving areas onto the shop floor itself. Remember, this is about on-shelf availability, not just system availability. There are some system-based tweaks that can help ensure a product gets to the shop floor in the quickest way possible. As an example of this, a simple alert on the receiver's terminal so that when an item is being received from a supplier, it alerts them that the item just scanned is currently out of stock. So then it can be quarantined for urgent dispatch to the shop floor. Within the store, a simple system to highlight which items are most critical to not be out of stock on shelf can be developed. 
This is a way of showing the employees on the floor where to focus. In the past, I have used a very simple ticket that has a specific color and is then double the size of a normal shelf edge ticket that slots behind the original to highlight that this product is different. Sometimes the simplest solutions are the easiest to implement quickly. Also, making sure that the replenishment system ordering matches sales means that the algorithm itself needs to be dynamic. This requires some data-driven solution within the systems you use. Having a gap zap solution in place on the store floor would mean having a fixed layout and then a very strict leave the gap policy in place so that every day the gaps can be zapped by a data terminal with a specific program that looks at the barcode scanned and tells the operator whether there are any items in stock or not. This can then be used to rapidly fill the gap if there is some in stock that may be in the stock room or maybe the system stock is incorrect and needs to be corrected. And of course, then a new order can be generated. The second part of the solutions is to look at the data-driven solutions providers. They are all able to examine your systems to optimize both availability and stockholding. However, I would initially caution against jumping straight in with a service provider for this. Why do I say this? It's simply a matter of awareness. If the systems start to do everything for the employees, the buyers, the warehouse managers, store managers, department heads, etc., then how do they learn for themselves how the system actually does its work? The employees need to have this inherent knowledge of stock management and availability. Otherwise, they will not know how to improve a poor availability measurement. If they don't know how the system works, how it is put together, and what it uses to calculate order and stock requirements, how do they know what to fix and where the root cause of any issues may be? Starting small with the top 100 lines first and getting the teams to understand how it all works will mean the teams can then start working on the solutions. As the team gets more adept, then the measurements can be expanded to give more insights. In a previous business, we started with a top 100 at the total business level. We quickly moved to the top 100 by store, then changed to total top selling at the 2080 Pareto principle by store, only at the simple measurement of more than zero means in stock. Once the team was comfortable with the data we were producing, we then started to add another 11 measurements to aid the teams in fixing the problems where the source may be. For example, the next measurement we looked at was POOS, P-O-O-S. This is potential out of stock. Using the system to look at sales versus stock, we could let the teams know which items were likely to run out of stock soon. Another measurement was NOOS, N-O-O-S. No order, out of stock, for the obvious reason. For those that would like to see all of the measurements I have used, these can be found in the document section of the retail101online.com website under Availability Measurement KPIs, or you can contact me and I can have a brief consultation with you as to how to set this up. Once your own systems have been cleaned up and you have a team that understands the inputs, there's that word again, only then would I suggest looking at an external solution provider and they will fine tune your systems even further. If you need a recommendation for that too, you know how to find me. The third part of the solution strategy is the simplest to implement. Hopefully by now, you will have realized that the real key to improving availability is having an understanding of the problem and then creating awareness of the challenge. Following on from this, you need to have a cross-functional approach to solving it. No one team or department can solve the challenge of availability. It has to be organization-wide and each team has a role to play and should be measured in the same way. This means that operations has to work with those pesky category managers and category managers have to work with the grunts at the stores. Different issues, as they are highlighted, can then be directed to the team best suited to solve it. For example, if more than 50% of the stores being measured on a specific product are out of stock, it will be directed to the commercial buying team to resolve with a supplier, as the likelihood is that a supplier is causing the issue rather than the stores. By ensuring a collaborative, cross-company approach where everyone is focused on the inputs and then measured on the same result, output, you should quickly start to see improvements. Communication and collaboration can go further by bringing suppliers into the loop. 
Some companies go as far as letting suppliers manage their inventory. This is an individual business choice and comes with its own challenges. However, even having a discussion with suppliers about on-shelf availability can help in some way to improve the situation. Holding regular meetings with suppliers and making on-shelf availability part of the discussion, this will send a message to the supplier that this is something that you, as the retailer, sees as important. After the supplier part of the inputs have been discussed, you can then start to work on the solutions, be it maybe a better order cycle, different pack sizes, adjusting the MOQ and EOQ details at either an individual product or even total order level, or of course, whatever other solution that presents itself. This can set you on a path to improve on-shelf availability. I will take an opportunity to reiterate again that the human solutions of awareness, responsibility and accountability, oh, hang on, was that three things again, are where any business should look first. In conclusion, the customer perception surrounding on-shelf availability is that it's initially an irritation for them. Apart from limited offer convenience stores and the hard discounters, most retail outlets offer multiple other variants of the same item the consumer is looking for, either a different pack size, a different brand, or alternative item fulfilling the same need. However, over time, that minor irritation can build to the level of frustration if the item they are looking for is regularly out of stock or multiple items on the customer's shopping list are not available. Once frustration starts to bed in, the customer will start to question whether their loyalty to a particular store is justified when there are so many other alternatives out there that are ready and willing to take their money. The barrier for a customer to switch to another retailer is quite low due to the prevalence of competitors. However, in the consumer's mind, the resistance to change from the comfort zone of the current store they use is quite high. This does not mean we should be complacent as eventually customers will transition their shopping to a new location if they are regularly coming across problems getting what they are looking for. I did say that I always tried to break things down into threes. So what are the three areas we have focused on in this episode? First, we have looked at defining what availability is and some of the measurement techniques, including how anyone can start up with a very simple system to see where they currently stand. Secondly, we discussed some of the common factors causing poor on-shelf availability. And then thirdly, some of the strategies and solutions for improving the situation. Wrapping up this episode, and as a call to action, you need to first decide what you want to measure. Start simple. For example, top 100 lines across a store, region, company, by initially just measuring does the system say more than one or less than one in stock, and then build out to more KPIs, for example, poos or news, as the situation improves. You can even do a physical shelf check, as we used to do it when we first introduced it. Take care not to increase stock whilst you are doing this, so you'll need to start measuring that too. But stock management is for another episode. Work collaboratively and make this an organization-wide initiative. It's not a store or department responsibility. It is across the organization. Reminder, once you have seen the output, investigate the inputs, as that's where the potential solutions will be found. Thank you so much for listening. And if you have any comments or queries, you can find me on LinkedIn and X, or send a message via the retail101online.com website. Take the time to subscribe and ring that bell wherever you listen to your podcasts so that you are made aware of when the next episode is released. And that's it, folks. Thank you so much for tuning in and we'll see you in the next episode, maybe in a couple of weeks' time. Cheers. Cheers.